has so we have stopped watching Fox or CNN or whatever you watch on the news. Thank you. Great. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of TRD Talks Live. I'm Eric Anquist, Senior Managing Editor at The Real Deal. I'm happy to be joined today by Mark Boswick, Managing Member Partner at Burden LLP, and Elliot Levine, Managing Member at Levine and Seltzer LLP, two of the top accountants in the New York City area. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So today we're going to talk about everyone's favorite federal aid program, PPP, otherwise known as the Paycheck Protection Program. And when I first looked at this, actually my jaw kind of dropped because I looked at these loans and then I realized that they weren't actually loans. They were designed as grants and this was going to be just one of the most breathtaking transfers of wealth that I had ever witnessed from the federal government to regular Americans through businesses. So I just wondered as accountants, whether you could, could you just take me through your individual reactions once you first realized what the scope of this program was and how it was going to work? Um, I guess, oh. go ahead, Mark. I guess, I guess the first thing I'll say is that, you know, and Elliot's uh, echoed these words to me many times. This was not a stimulus program like it's been, like it's been provided or it's been, been said. It really is almost a, another form of unemployment. And what they're using is, in effect, the employers as a mechanism to keep them retained on salary as opposed to having them fall onto the unemployment ranks and have to be dealt with that way. And the reality is that the system, the rules, the way they put them forth, the time constraints because of the way the virus has extended um, and all of the other criteria really, really do not work. But just the order of magnitude, I mean, the government first announced that they were gonna put out $350 billion in this program. They later on added 310 billion. Um, ultimately, the deadline was June 30th. It's now been extended through August 8th. And there's approximately 150 billion more to go um, if they can actually get that out in the system. And that's a big if. Yeah, Elliot, what, what did you think? When you, I mean, well, it, as accounts, I'm sure you like things to be orderly and neat. Well, okay, this was anything but, you know, this was a great attempt by the government to keep people off of unemployment so they could report lower numbers. Really simple. Uh, as Mark said, we even had lots of discussions. This is not stimulus. You know, you listen to the people in the restaurant industry who said, thank you for giving me money, but I'm not open yet. I can't, you know, I'm going to give it to people. Yeah, there's the loan forgiveness, which is the whole other area, which, you know, that'll be the next, you know, all the articles will be written about it. But this really didn't help businesses. Okay, you had to spend the money. This legislation, in our opinion, was not written by any accountants. There was more uncertainty about it. You know, when it first came out, everyone was, I had clients calling me up and say, I'm going to file the application tomorrow and I'm going to have the money by Friday. And we're, we're sitting there laughing because when the application came out and not blaming anyone, they rushed to get $350 billion into the hands of people. But when the legislation came out, the, the simplest thing, the legislation said, you do all your computation based on trailing 12 months. So everyone said, okay, trailing 12 months, end of March, it's simple to do. And then the SBA's form comes out and says 2019 payroll data. So everyone's looking at it like saying, which one do you use? No one knew. And they handled it correctly. They said, pick whichever one you want. We don't yeah, care. That, that was kind it, of the fly it doesn't, matter, wait, it doesn't <laughs> matter. It doesn't matter which one because they didn't care. It wasn't the stimulus program to build up companies. It was how can we put money into the hands of employers to pay people who aren't working so that right. we don't have to say they're, so we don't have to say they're on unemployment. But the funniest part is when the May payroll numbers come out and the unemployment numbers come out and people are expecting them to go down again, you know, more on unemployment. And they said, look at all the people who got jobs. It was like, well, if you put $350 billion to hire people, I don't know, you might have some thought that people are going to be hired. <laughs> well, I guess what you say it didn't help businesses. There were some that were able to stay open in essential, in essential business lines where they were serving customers. But, but the, what you're saying is there were a lot who were getting the money, passing it along to workers, but not actually open. 
But if you were open and getting revenue in, you didn't need the PPP. If your business was operating and you were doing business as normal, you didn't need the PPP. Right, and the program made no distinction between the ones that were still getting business, like you know, mail order companies, for instance, and those who were hurting. Right. The reality is the reality is the restaurant industry, the hospitality industry. When you look at, you have to spend this money during you know an eight week period and all these other things that have somewhat been corrected. It's impossible. It's physically impossible. And to, and to hire people just to give the money doesn't make didn't make any sense to business owners. Really now, in, ter in terms of helping clients, I mean, your job is to help clients get this money if it's going to be helpful to them. Is it still possible to get a PPP loan? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. We've been working with there are companies um, that are still making loans. You still have, I think, so August 8th, they extended the date to do your application. Don't go to big banks. Traditionally, I don't know, Mark, Mark's laughing because his experience has been the same as mine. You know, I spent a lot of time helping small businesses who, you know, you said, oh, no, I've got my banker at the local Chase and, or, you know, Bank of America. They can't help you. There are the community banks. There are other companies that I dealt with who they know how to do it. They're very equipped to do it. They're very happy to get it. You know, going back to what you, you said, Eric, you know, the program from the beginning, one of the other funny things is one of the first banks to announce that they were making the loans was Bank of America. And I have a client literally who was at seven o'clock in the morning on that Friday, submitted all that, had all their papers ready to go. And then Bank of America said, wait, you don't have a loan with us. Okay, so w w w we can't make it to you. And then- oh, He was a customer, but he was not a borrower. Not, a, lender, not, a, not a lending customer. Not, you know? not a borrower. Yeah. And you know, the, the problem also with the loan program that people didn't understand all the, the problems, the original legislation said the PPP loan was going to be a loan at 4%, 4% interest. And then Secretary Mnuchin came out and said, no, no, we're going to make it better. We're going to make it a half percent loan. And all the big banks said, we're not making a loan at a half percent. Why are they here? Well, because it wasn't, it wasn't the SBA's money that was funding it. The banks were making the loan and they don't want to have a loan on their books for a half percent. Yeah. That, 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 was part, that was part of the misconception. It really is the bank's money that's getting lent in Correct. the first instance. And what happened is when they went from 4% to a half a percent, they ultimately came back to 1% to get other people involved. But the, the banks that were SBA lenders that were in this business and were geared up to do it, that was fine. But the big banks that most people dealt with really were not geared up or they were arranging portals behind the scenes. I can tell you so many stories of clients telling me, no, don't worry, we're covered, we're covered, we're covered. And then I get the panic call, oops, they said we're not covered. Right. And also, you know, like, like Elliot mentioned, you know, the, the banks, the bigger banks were really taking care of their most important clients first, so to speak, which, you know, you can't, say that's against clients, human, like, you can't say that's against human nature, yeah. but that then led to all the outcry of who's getting the money because the mom pa guy generally is not their most important client. So the people that needed the money the most, arguably, were not being able to get access to it. So did either of you find sort of obscure lenders that were able to make these loans happen faster than you would? Uh, are we allowed to mention them? I'll yeah, mention. absolutely. There, there, there's a great company called Cabbage, K-A-B-B-A-G-E dot com that is phenomenal. Uh, literally two weeks ago, one of my clients who was denied by their, the, the problem is a lot of people had banks that weren't doing the loans. So they had no place to go. And my client said, gee, I've got, you know, this, my business, small business, but I got on the website for Cabbage. Literally, it took one and a half hours if you prep ahead of time, filed the papers. Day and a half later, they got notification that the loan's been approved. Four days later, the loan was funded. <laughs> and, and there's also, if you go, the, the, there's someone called the SBA advocate for the New York, New Jersey area, for example. And she has a list of banks, community banks, that she had sent me that we called them up for several clients and they were very happy because in addition to getting interest, they were getting a 5% fee into a local bank. They sat there and said, I'm getting 5%, even at 1%, okay, interest for two years, worst case, 7% for two years, three and a half percent a year. It's not the worst thing in the world. Mm -hmm. So they, and they're geared as, as Mark said, 
they know how to process an SBA loan. You know, you, you go to the big bank, it's a step, I, I don't know if the experiences Mark has had, but literally clients were getting rejected, okay, by the big banks. Oh, there's something wrong with your application. Sorry, you're not getting any money. And it was like, why aren't you getting money? Oh, they couldn't tell me. Yeah. So it even, yeah. it, even, it, it even morphed for more than that, that the application process was changed. Each bank had their own application process. You know, when they first passed the legislation, there was a certain criteria for how you would size the amount of loan you would be able to get. And there was another criteria as how you had to spend the money in order to get the forgiveness, which we'll talk about later on. That somehow morphed, not legislatively, but that somehow morphed into the fact that you must spend the money the way the forgiveness requires it. Where I had people in the hotel business or restaurant business, they were saying, you know what, I'll take the loan. I'm not looking for a forgiveness, but hopefully it'll get me through to 2021, 2020, midway through there, and I'll pay the loan back. But there were restrictions that were really not within the intention of legislation that were imposed by the banks on them. Yeah. So, so Eric, it goes to your opening comment that you thought of it as a gift. I had many situations, just as Mark said, where I said to the client, don't spend it. In other words, don't have it forgiven. Worst case scenario, you have a two-year loan paying 1% interest. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that's not the worst place to be. And now they've, so you, you follow through what our government has tried to do. And I use the word try because I think they did. So then they came out with the Flexibility Act and they said, you know what, we're going to change all the rules we told you about. We're changing them. So what did they change? First, they told you you have to spend 10 weeks payroll in eight weeks, which in a way was probably the only good thing for the real estate industry because one of the things they allowed you to spend the money on to quote, be forgiven was rent, rent. and mortgage payments. So that was great. Except then they come out with the Flexibility Act and they say, you don't have to spend it in eight weeks. You can spend it in 24 weeks. All right, there goes the real estate industry. Sorry guys, you're, <laughs> you're not getting it. They gave it, they gave it back to them a little bit on the other end because the initial criteria was 75% had to be spent for employees Right. And 25% had to be paid for rent, utilities. And they now, because they knew that wasn't, that wasn't realistic either because they weren't getting the employees back quick enough. So they made, went to 60, 40 on that. Right. The um, problem is you now have 24 weeks to spend the 60%. So the answer is real estate's not getting any of that money. Uh, uh, it was a great idea. I, and I said this to you, Eric, when we were prepping for this, I said, I just wish they would have gotten accountants involved. Okay. <laughs> and drafting it. They could have made it so much simpler. But let me ask you this. If there were accountants involved, do you think it would, you would have made it a little bit harder to game this system? Because I would imagine it's possible to game the system. That is, to take advantage of it in ways that are legal. But well, there was been, the you know, from the very beginning, there was this certification that had to be done. And before we get there, you know, the one other challenging thing, Elliot, I think I've wrestled with a lot is you would wake up every morning and the rules were changed. No matter what they said, independent contractors count, independent contractors don't count. Partners count, partners don't count. Medical um, counts in the hundred, medical doesn't. Profit right. sharing counts. I, I, it was I great. I mean, and you're trying to give people advice who are obviously very stressed out because their livelihood, their business is, is, is going down and you're trying to help them. As far as gaming systems, you know, it said at the very beginning that all these applications were subject to the Freedom of Information Act and there were certifications. And at the beginning, you know, people were very kind of liberal about that interpretation and looking at it. And then a couple of things hit the news about certain people getting loans that maybe shouldn't deserve it. They then started putting out pronouncements that if you're a public company and you have access to capital, you should not be, you should not be looking for this money. You know, let's be clear. Real estate entities per se are not, are not, a flip, are not eligible for these loans. A real estate management company could be, yes. but a real estate ownership company is not subject to these rules. Um, and I've had plenty of people that say, you know, I have cash in my business, we're well-funded, I'm not necessarily gonna take it. But what I do need to do is I need to figure out how to get this money to my tenants so that they can figure out how to pay their rent. And that really is, is a more meaningful thing as far as relating to the real estate industry sometimes. So, Eric, you said if accountants were involved, you know, one of my pet peeves, surprisingly, as, as Mark was just talking, there was a certification, I'll call it the moral compass, that you had to sign a piece of paper that said, I've been affected by COVID, I need the money. Great, 
Okay, that's when Shake Shack, the, you know, came out and said, "Well, maybe I didn't need the money." And Harvard, you know, Harvard, Harvard said, didn't well, need it. Harvard, maybe the I Lakers, didn't need the it. Lakers didn't need it, maybe. You okay. know, um, uh, so so great. But they had the moral, and there was a penalty if you lied and you really didn't need it. You signed this under penalties of perjury. There were penalties. Great. Before that, the government announces that anyone who got a loan over two million dollars, they're going to audit you. That might take place in, you know, in 2031. Who knows when they'll order you, but leave that aside. Then they come out and they say, I think it was in the Flexibility Act, they say, okay, here's what we're doing. If you borrowed less than $2 million, we're not questioning that you needed it. We think that if you only needed less than $2 million, you must have really had no other sources of capital. So automatically, your certification is good. So take less than $2 million, lie that you need it, you're good. Okay. Fine. Then they go one step further. And if you took over $2 million and we audit you and we find out that you shouldn't have gotten it, here's your penalty. Just give me back the money at a 1% interest rate. So I want all of our real estate people listening that the next time they negotiate their loans with the bank and they put in a penalty provision, just put in, we're going to have the same penalty as was in the PPP program. If we're in default, we'll pay you 1%. Yeah, I mean, it's not even it's not even a penalty. Like you'd kill for a one percent loan. Correct. They took away the moral compass, and they didn't. And then they tried to. And what they tried to do is they tried to use, uh, let's call it, persuasion to get people to put back the money. So they said, "I'll tell you what. Forget these penalties, which don't even exist. But if you put back the money by X Y Z date, um, we'll play. You know, no harm, no foul. Everybody can go their own way. Didn't get enough money back in, so they extended it. <laughs> oh, you can put no, no. If you don't want to put back, how about next week? If you put back by next week, it's okay. Um, so what, what about, um, so in terms of gaming the system, and I had uh, someone who owns a small construction business call me up and said, I don't understand, like, could, could I just, you know, pay, get one of these loans, put myself and my wife on the payroll, pay us a bunch of money, and then the, have that loan be forgiven? I said, it didn't sound to me like that's the way Congress intended the program to work, but I can't two, speak two to different Wait, two different, two different questions. One, is that what Congress intended or is that what you can do? So let's go, is that, okay. So is that what Congress intended? We would all say probably not, okay. Is that what you can do? Yes, they put in this wonderful safe harbor. The safe harbor is, there are two, let's assume you've spent the money. Now you have 24 weeks to spend the money. You have 24 weeks to spend eight weeks worth of, 10 weeks worth of salary, okay. To have the loan forgiven, technically the way the rules read, you have to have the same number of employees during the period, and you have to be paying them the same amount. So then they dropped in a safe harbor, which says, as of the testing date, I mean one day, if you have the same number of employees, not the same people, but the same number of employees making the same amount, you get all of your loan forgiven. So now what you can do is, you have 24 weeks to spend 10 weeks of salary. So you don't have to hire back all your people. Okay. Then on December 29th, hire the same number of people. Okay. That you had prior to at the same salary, fire them on January 5th. You technically meet the definition and now you get your loan fully uh, forgiven. Wow. So can you game the system? Yes. And yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, you wouldn't advise anyone to do that, just for the record. <laughs> uh, listen, the other thing is there's been a lot of stuff about hotel management companies because the way it works in that industry is the employees generally all sit on the management company. And there's been a couple of large hotel management companies that got $40, 50000000 million in these loans. Because, by the way, when they say there's a cap of $10 million per loan, that's per entity. So if you have you know, a conglomerate that's got 30, 40 entities, that $10 million test is applied at each individual level. Um, they do that for franchises also, Mark? Where? I've only had it where each one was in a separate LLC. Right. All franchises franchise. of the same franchisor yeah. are in a separate LLC. I, I believe that's why Shake Shack probably right. was able to get all their money. Yep. Right? Yeah, well, that's the beauty of having entities, right? Because if any government program is designed that, to limit the size of the entity that can apply, if you have a bunch of different entities, they can each apply. That's yeah, but you can make them all sit. You can make them all, you know, disregarded entities, make them, you know, 100% owned separate LLCs, and you apply under each LLC separately. So yes, 
the answer to your question is, can the system be gained? Yes. Could, could, it, could it have been prevented? Probably, maybe not in the time frame that they did it. But the thing Mark said before was so true. We would constantly, every day, wake up and find something else come out. And it would just change. I had a client literally call me when they came out with the Flexibility Act, in which they extended the eight weeks to 24 weeks. Now, he had already spent seven weeks, and what he did is he kept all his employees on because his theory was, rather than give it back to the government, I'll give it to my employees. They weren't right. working because they were in Broadway and they couldn't, nothing for them to do, but he was paying them. And he just said to me, you know, Elliot, had I known I had 24 weeks to spend the money, I would have done it differently. Yeah, for, because I think initially, Congress wasn't expecting the pandemic to last as long as it has. And, you know, it turns out 24 weeks might not even have helped Broadway because it could be closed for you know a year. Broadway's not, yeah, Broadway's not opening quickly. Yeah, but a lot of other businesses will probably be able to reopen later this year and have already blown through their PPP. Correct. Money. So, yeah. Correct. Yeah. So, so I mean, the other, I guess, one of the other, you know, the biggest kind of unspoken about change, um, or is not spoken about as much, is all of a sudden the government comes in. They not the government. When they passed the legislation. They specifically put in there that the forgiveness of the PPP loan does not constitute taxable income, okay? So that was clearly the intention. What happens on May 1st, the IRS issues a notice and the notice says, okay, we can't change it the fact that the income is not gonna be taxable. But what we can do is say that any items of expenses that otherwise would have been deductible that you spend this money on are now no longer deductible. And I don't even really, under, I don't really believe that a lot of people fully have digested or understand that little nuance, but that is a major difference of whether or not the government can get back in effect 35, 40% apply a tax rate to that of the money they gave out in one way, shape or form or not. Wow, well, does that create a problem when it comes time to filing your tax returns and now you have to identify which expenses were deductible and which were not? Well, well they define it. I mean, it's sort of defined, but the answer is, is it gonna be done correctly? Absolutely not. Not. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely not. Why not? <laughs> because it's not as easy as you think. I'll get, tell you the real reason. I don't think 50% of the people who have gotten PPP loans understand that provision of that notice. Okay. It, it, it got a lot of play in the papers. The senators all came out and this is the concern. All the senators came out and said, as Mark said, that wasn't the intent of the legislation. The legislation was clear. This might have been the only benefit for owners, okay? And the announce notice came out, but the interesting part is they could have changed it in, you know, in a second, the treasury secretary could have called up the commission of the IRS and said, pull the notice. That's not what I intended when I did this. Nothing's happened. You don't even hear it anymore. It wasn't in the Flexibility Act, okay? They could have put it anywhere if they intended to change it. So. Sitting here, having done this for several years, you come to the realization they're not changing it. It might have been a sidebar attempt. It's a way to reduce the actual cost of the PPP program. Because as Mark said, if you put on a 30% tax break, okay, on $400 million, the government could get back 120 of the money that they've put out. They don't tell you that, but they don't tell you that. Yeah, I mean, billions. With billions, the so now every time a law passes, you know, there's an agency that has to write a regulation to implement the law. And this all happened very fast. I mean, I would imagine there were a lot of contradictions between the legislation itself and the guidance that was issued by agencies as far as how to implement it. Did you write a, a, lot of this, a lot of this has fallen back on the SBA to issue guidance and the rules that were maybe applicable to an SBA, because an SBA loan was a very different creature at the time it was given. It was given as incentive for somebody to start up a new business or things like that. And even it is, it is replete with inconsistencies wherever you look between the legislation and the pronouncements that have been put out there as far as that goes. So and the, yeah, and the SBA full -time what is a full-time, you know, Elliot, Elliot mentioned that, you know, if you have a reduction in headcount, then there could be a proportionate reduction in your forgiveness of, of indebtedness. Okay, what is a full-time equivalent? What does that mean? I mean, we've gleamed, we've gleamed things from 
footnotes in various SBA pronouncements about what they say a full-time equivalent is, but I don't believe there's anything actually been put out there as it relates to so many of these terms that should have been defined somewhere. And, and the SBA tries, they have the, the, their questions with answers and every time they do try and give guidance, but you know, it's not easy, okay? And you know, it's written in such a way that it's more confusing at times, as Mark said, literally what's included and what's not included. So going back to your original, People thought it was automatically forgiven. It's not automatically forgiven. You should think of it as if you got a 1% loan with an ability not to pay some of it back. Right. That's the better way. Well, you know, I have to say, like, you said the worst case scenario is you get a 1% loan, but that can be bad if you have no revenue for a long period of time because paying back a loan when you go months without any revenue, you're going to be in a hole. So well, now they've extended it. So, so here was another fun one. In the Flexibility now Act, now five in the Flexibility Act, they said for any loans made after the the date of the Flexibility Act, which I think was June sixth or June fifth, it's now a five year loan, not a two year loan. Hmm. But if you already got the money, you can ask your bank if they'll make it five years. <laughs> yeah, what you call and ask nicely. Right, right, yeah, yeah, like, hey, do you mind carrying a loan on your books for five years at 1%? I'm sure all the banks are just saying, hey, great deal for us, wonderful. <laughs> but in, instead of mandating that, that they're going to change it, you have to, it literally says, if the bank agrees, then they'll adjust it. Yeah, uh, I'm not holding my breath for any banks to agree to that. Well, the, the, what the banks really want, just so you understand, is the banks want the loan forgiveness because this is not, this is a bank loan. Mm -hmm. And the banks don't want these loans on their books, not right. a 1% loan. And the only way it gets taken off of their books, okay, is if there's the loan forgiveness. Because then what happens, then the Fed funds the loan, okay, and takes it off the books of the bank. Yeah, so the now, bank by the way, what happens if the loan is not forgiven um, and then eventually the borrower goes out of business? SBA. Oh, it, is, it is federally guaranteed. Yeah, SBA takes care of it. So the banks so are going to The bank is protected right? from that, but until then, they're carrying a 1% loan on their books, which they're not real happy about, um, mm -hmm. which is what causes half the problems. Yeah. So and they even tell you, but there was a whole, in my, in, my, in my belief, there was a whole political thing going on behind the scenes between the bank, the Treasury, and the SBA, because there were such thin margins on the stat, as Elliot mentioned, Nobody wanted to commit capital. People were not in that business of doing that, yet they're getting a mass outcry from all of their clients saying, hey, you gotta help us with this, you gotta help us with this. And that's why, you know, they first said, we'll help everybody. And very quickly, the big ones, and I won't mention their names, but you know their names, like I said, they said, listen, you gotta be a customer. And they even went as far to say, it's not, it's not good enough, you're a customer, you have to be a lending customer. And one by one, or we have all the money you need and up is all gone. So it's been very, I feel very bad for some of the small business owners yeah. that were trying to navigate this, particularly without any professional help, um, because it was difficult yeah. with all the talent in the world. I mean, right. and and psychologically, it was tough for small businesses, minority businesses, who thought they were going to get money, and thought they knew what they were doing, and then were getting rejected. I mean, there were many people who filed applications, and then they got rejected by the SBA. And unless you were a big customer of the bank. The bank didn't look at your application to find out why you were rejected. They just turned around and said, sorry, your loan was rejected. So is it a good program? It's better than what was there beforehand because there was nothing there beforehand. There was nothing. Okay. Was nothing. okay. Will it help? Yeah, it's definitely going to help, but it's not a stimulus. It's not something that's going to stimulate the economy. Okay. Right. So now, of course, um, once the data started coming in, people started analyzing it and Surprise, surprise, they figured out that the, in the neighborhoods that needed it most were getting the least. I mean, that, I'm sure that came as no, no shock to you guys, but you, you know the sort of the background of why it worked out that way. It's because of these hoops that you have to jump through and who has the relationships and sort of the resources to jump through them. Yeah, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's scary, uh, to be honest. It did not get to the right people. 
the scarier part is there's still 150 billion, give or take, that's available. And there are still many people who could use the loans. But as you said before, Eric, they don't know where to go for it. And the, the small accountant, the local accountant, you know, the ones dealing with the mom and pop stores, as we'll sometimes mm -hmm. call them, okay? They're not sure where to apply because if they go to the big banks, honestly, as Mark said, the big banks don't want it. You know, real estate is interesting. We were talking about this the other day. How can landlords get benefit from the PPP? They should know all the banks that are doing PPP loans and turn to their tenants and send out a flyer and say, if you haven't gotten a PPP loan, i.e. pay your rent, um, here are banks that are willing to do it and here's a form to use. Okay, maybe this will help you. And if you get the money, pay your rent. Um, but that's the only way, you know, you, you feel sorry for people in this, this situation. Yeah, so one of the things is when you have a program like this is there are always a million questions that people have about the program itself, about what happened there, particular loan. And I can imagine, you know, in fact, I know for a fact, there are a lot of phone calls, people trying to get through to a human in the federal government to answer these questions. And I'm sure you on occasion had to do that too because the answer is not on the website or whatever. Um, how, how possible is this to actually get answers from the SBA or another federal agency, Treasury Department, on to some of these questions? Can you get people there? I'll let you take first crack at that one, Mark. I know my well, You mentioned, I mean, the answer is no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the long and the short answer is no. I will say I was impressed by you, really, though, when you said to me you found out uh, that person that was the SBA kind of coordinator, you're the only person I know that's not an actual human being to talk I to. Thought she, she's amazing. She, her job is, she's an advocate for not the SBA, but for people trying to get to the SBA. And she is, um, she, Mary, she's just been great. Chris has been great. I mean, literally, she sent me a list of banks. And if you go on the SBA website, you can find a list of local banks you put in the area of community banks. And literally I sat on the phone because I, I felt bad for people who just couldn't get these. Okay, and I called up some of the local guy, banks and I said, hey, I have a, know someone who's looking to get a loan. Will you do it? Yeah, sure, no problems. You know, have them get in touch. They're not a depositor at that bank. You know, the local community banks are looking at it that maybe they'll get a client, maybe they won't. But they're very happy to get a 5% admin fee, okay? and make the interest on the loan. They were, and they're here to do it because for them to do it, it took one day. I mean, I don't know what Mark's experience has been, but the big banks, if, if it was a week at minimum, if you were lucky, if you submitted your application on Monday to the bank, if a week later they got back to you, you were considered very lucky, mm -hmm. very lucky. They were they were they were out of they were fish out of water in dealing with this process. Yep. They really really were. They they've never dealt with it. SBA is a, a separate kind of entity to deal with, and uh, not that it's ultimately complicated or complex. It's just their systems and procedures right. to follow. And they they didn't have the technology to deal with it. A lot of people they just didn't have the you know the resources. As we talk about unemployment. I'm going off a little bit on a tangent, but you know everybody says how could you give people more unemployment insurance than they were collecting when they were working. What, what are we doing here? And the reality is everybody understands that. That makes no sense. Uh, well, don't say everybody. By the way, don't say, don't say everybody. Okay, I take <laughs> that back. But the technology, believe it or not, is not there to say on Social Security number XYZ, limit that number to no more than what he reported on his W-2 last year or something to that effect. You just can't do it. Yeah, so now one of the things about these you mentioned like people don't have the capability, you know, because their their expertise is their own business, not all this stuff, right? That's your area. Now, my brother used to work for Ernst and Young for many years, and I remember they had a T-shirt that said, "From regs to riches, like from regulations to riches." Uh -huh. like, this must be good for your industry. Like anytime there are complex regulations, you need people like you guys to figure this out. I mean, this this somehow really this is what keeps accounting firms busy. You know, every time someone passes a law, you got to hire people to figure this out. Isn't that what you do? Yes. All day? Yes. 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 And no. No. Yes, it keeps yes, busy. No. yes. It keeps people busy. The question is, what is the value you're adding for this busyness to them? And is it really going to get compensated? Uh, is, it, is it going to get compensated? I mean, listen, we do this. We help our clients. Most of our clients have been with us for 
generations, tens of years, and they're part of our family. We make sure we take care of them. But yeah. people, people were turning to the bankers because who would they turn to? The banks were the bankers didn't. The bankers knew less than the attorneys and the accountants. They had no idea what was going on. And as we were backpedaling on the change of rules every morning, they were two or three days behind them what was going on. So there was no help there. Yeah, and and it, you know it, it, it's interesting what you just said, but it's not. A lot of the work we did on this wasn't, gee, we're going to get more fees. It was more we were trying to help clients out, okay? It's different than when the government passes, like when they passed the tax legislation in 2017. And then we figure we're sitting there figuring out all the ways to deal with how we can deal with the, the new legislation, okay? And, and how we can help clients benefit from, you know, gee, what do we do okay. with local taxes? What do we do here? Different a, good example, a good example would be when they passed the tangible cap ranks that on the real estate industry a few years ago, and it gave much bigger breadth and deductibility and things like that. That you can demonstrate. I'm going to spend some time. I'm going to go back right. over a few years. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to save everybody money. Right. This yeah, is, you know, the, the biggest area here, from a, if you want to call it a value-added perspective, will be trying to figure out how much of a loan forgiveness a client will get. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's, a, that's key that you asked that, because actually one of our viewers just chatted me a question. Uh, do either of you have clients that have submitted a forgiveness application and what has the process been like? Huh. I, I, uh, have we people, haven't had I have not, I have actually submitted. I have people that are getting very close. The eight week period has just really, the first thing was eight week period has really just come to an end. Mm -hmm. I mean, the question is whether you want to advise a client to be the first one through the door or not, right. quite frankly, with all this other craziness going on out there. And, and, and it's, it's really interesting if you talk about the uncertainty. So they changed it to 24 weeks. You now have 24 weeks to spend it. And one of the questions you have is how many employees you have at the end of the 24 weeks for your measurement of forgiveness. So the question people ask is, well, what happens if I've spent it all in 12 weeks? Do I do all my measurements at the end of 12 weeks? Or since I'm now in the 24 week period, do I have to wait the 24 weeks? And we give them the answer, great question. You know, and one of these days they're gonna come out with a great answer, not yet. Um, you don't know. I mean, we've, you know, we've been like all the firms, we're all preparing the spreadsheets to try and figure out, and we have clients trying to monitor it. Uh, but it's interesting because the forgiveness is done at the bank level, okay? And I'm sure the banks are cringing right now because they don't get any extra money for the forgiveness. But the way it goes is you have to present documentation, you have to give proof, and you have to give it to your bank, and then your bank has to sit with it, and I think they have to do some sort of at least minimalist test, okay, before they say, gee, you've met the forgiveness level. Um, so you're going to make sure you got all your ducks lined up before you submit any of well, that. You have, like, what do you have? You have 10 months after you've got, what's the period now? There's um, an, isn't it? It is 10 months. But it's so now what I tell people is you take the money, any PPP money you got, number one, you should have put it in a segregated bank account and just leave it there. And then what I've told them to do is just fund ADP, whoever's your payroll service out of it, and pay your rent. And at the time a lot of this was going on, we were still in the 75 25 ratio. But be prepared and have all the payroll documentation. And again, it's not just your payroll records because each employee is capped at $100,000. Um, for, on an annual basis, so there's some computational. It's it's not it, it's not as easy as people think, and this is the area where there's a value. But you know, to your clients, this is sort of what we do. Okay, you know, we try and help them get through the trouble time. Like like I said, I spend a lot of time with people who aren't clients, where I get phone calls. Gee, can you help a friend out? That's what we do also. Mm -hmm. But I have a couple more questions. The one person, which one of which I can actually answer myself, which is. Wouldn't banks be incentivized to hand out forgiveness as the loans would be re refunded by the SBA? And you, you said, yes, absolutely, because they don't want to carry these 1% loans on their books. For, get the loan forgiven, move on, right? yep. back to your regular business. Another person, as, long as, they do, as long as they do the bare minimal that they can't be criticized by correct. the SBA or the government, that's all they're looking to do. Right, because okay. the last thing, last thing they want to do is get stuck with the loan. Yeah, and, uh, another person asked, I'm a small business owner, single member LLC. You recommend an accountant or an attorney to help prepare a PPP application? Like, what's the first step? That people Mark and I would tell you we never use attorneys. You know, come on, yeah, yeah. No, I, no th this is a look. I would no, use I someone, 
Yeah, yeah I, would, I would say it's, it's a numbers thing. Correct. It really is a numbers thing. So you can make your decision based upon, I'll leave it with that since I'm an attorney and an accountant, but the reality is uh, um, it's really, there's a lot of detail. There's a lot of Excel schedules. There's a lot of things like that when you get into it. Um, mm -hmm. There really is. I, I, would, I would go one step, go to someone you trust, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, and if you trust the person, the person says they know how to do it, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But you got to trust the person because, right. you know, too many people will say they know, oh, yeah, you know, we can help you. Uh, and I'm sure there are probably companies that are coming out and saying, we can help you do this for a fee. It's got to be someone you trust. So yeah, there I've, always, are, I've, always, I've always seen people trying to market that as, yeah. as an aside, yeah. So there are multiple rounds of this. Like, if, if you have already applied for and received a PPP loan, um, can you get another one? And if so, should you apply for forgiveness first and then apply for the next one? Well, you can't get, you know, the amount you got under a PPP was, was computational. It was basically your payroll during the period times, monthly payroll times two and a half, and that's the amount you got. So the only way you could apply, and there was a provision you could apply because Originally, they, they didn't allow partners yeah, they to be included, and they said, you talked about confusion. Originally, they said, no partners, partners don't get money. And then someone said, well, maybe we should let partners get money. And then people said, but I've already gotten my loan. So they put a provision in that said, if you've already gotten a loan, and now you want to amend it, you can amend it, provided your bank hasn't done certain things yet. But if you're just a regular business, you should have applied for the maximum, unless you made a mistake and they, did a, they didn't include medical or pension. Uh, I, I had one where people thought that they, because there's something that says you can include taxes, state taxes. Okay, so they were including all the withholding taxes on people's payroll instead of realizing that the only taxes they could would count are like the unemployment insurance. And then the banks were rejecting them and they had no idea why. Mm -hmm. I, I want well, another just one little nuance. What you say the amount in doing the computation of forgiveness, it looks at the maximum amount of the loan you were eligible to get, not what you did take. So you could actually have a scale down because of a reduction in headcount things and still get 100% of your loan forgiven. An mm -hmm. example would be somebody filed for their loan, they didn't include their partners. Later on, they realized, oh, I could include my partners. Okay, then when they go to do the computation, the amount that could be forgiven is based upon what they could have gotten, which includes the partners. So even if the headcount goes down, they might be, they might actually be okay. Mm -hmm. I, we only have one minute left. I want to get in this last uh, viewer's question, uh, which is, and this is someone from the live events industry, which as the viewer points out, they were the first to close, you know, live events like, you yep. know, um, and they're probably going to be the last ones to open. So this is 24 weeks. I mean, forget about it. This is going to be a huge period of time. Is there any relief in the PPP or any other programs for, for those folks? There are other programs. There's something called the Main Street Lending Program, which the government has just funded again, um, which gives businesses the ability to get, if you don't have any loans with them, six times your EBITDA, and it's payable. It's like a 3.7% interest rate, and it's payable over five years, you pay interest only for two years, 15% uh, of the principal year three, 15% in year four, and then 70% at the end of year five. That, that's something that's available through, the, get to it through the SBA. Uh, but there are sort of handcuffs with respect to it. And the handcuffs are how much you can pay out in compensation, certain things you can do with it, what you can do with the money. But if you're desperate, okay, it's something to look at, but remember, it's based on earnings. Mm -hmm. So if you had a company that wasn't making money, they're not going to lend you. Yeah. Um, so, um, and you know, th thirty seconds left. But I want to answer the other part of this person's question: like, how do we lobby for uh, for a program for us at live events? And the answer is probably not calling your accountants. That's for the lobbyists, and we'll do a separate <laughs> show. We can do a separate show with lobbyists, and they'll tell you how they do what they do. And the last first, last question was. Uh, what would you like to see most for another round of PPP loans? Like what, something different from before? Um, more, more providing more capital for businesses, not put such, make it a year, make it that you don't have to spend the money 
until you open. Give a time frame after you've opened so the money is available to you to build your business back up as opposed to pay people while you're trying. I mean, that to me would be the biggest difference. Change the time frame on which you have to spend the money. That's a great answer because when businesses reopen, it's not like they re reopen at 100% of the revenue they had before. Right. Um, so you always lose money at the beginning when you open a business and it takes a while. So that makes a lot of sense. Well, I want to thank uh, both Mark Boswick of Burden LLP and Ellie Levine of Levine and Seltzer for your time and answering all these complicated questions about the Paycheck Protection Program. Thanks to all of our viewers for watching. Don't forget to go to therealdeal.com to subscribe and come back on August 5th. We are going to do a show I'll be monitoring again on rezoning and the watery zone, New York City. So thanks again, Mark and Elliot, for your Thank time. You. Our pleasure. Thank Our you. Our pleasure. And we'll Thank see you. everyone next time on TRD Talks Live. Thanks again, everyone.